Welcome to our Curious Amalgam, the weekly podcast brought to you by the Antitrust Law Section of the American Bar Association. Our Curious Amalgam explores the fascinating and increasingly overlapping world of competition, consumer protection, data protection, and privacy law. Each week, we bring you leading global experts on the most compelling issues of the day. Enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to our Curious Amalgam, the podcast from the American Bar Association Antitrust Law Section. My name is John Roberti. Today's topic is, will the past repeat itself? Understanding the implications of the government's case against IBM. It's been more than 50 years uh, since the government began an investigation into what was then the tech giant IBM. The case ended up being a a multi-year battle um, that that went on um, and was at the time very much a cutting edge case. In many ways, reflecting on it, uh, it sounds a lot like what we hear is going on currently as the government contemplates uh, the role of antitrust related to technology companies. Today, we've invited a leading scholar uh, to come and join us, uh, and he studied the IBM case uh, in detail. He's going to talk about the history, how it all came to be, And we think that it's going to resonate with what's going on in today's climate. Joining me today is my co-host, Anora Wang. Hi, Anora. Hi, John. So, Anora, what are we doing today? Today, we'll talk about the once epic 13-year-long U.S. antitrust case against IBM brought in 1969, litigated through the 70s, and eventually withdrawn with the remedies, I think, in 1982, through which we will also have a general discussion on whether and how antitrust actions could have an impact on the landscape of the tech industries, perhaps for decades to come. What, what, uh, why is that important? Two reasons, really. First, antitrust attention to IBM, one of the longest living tech companies that we know of and still thrive today, provides a unique focal point to explore what I call a grand theory, examining antitrust enforcement and the growth of tech. And then second, IBM has actually gone through several major U.S. antitrust cases, which could include as early as in 1930s and 50s, uh, where there were cases brought by the U.S. government involving punch cards, tabulating equipment, and then late 60s and 70s, what we were discussed today, uh, involving computers. So that really marks a major chapter in the history of U.S. antitrust enforcement against the tech companies. You know, it's, it's just funny to hear you say that there were tech cases brought, uh, brought related to punch cards, but <laughs> yeah. um, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it, it is remarkable. I, I, I still think we are going to hear quite a bit about things resonating. Well, who's our guest today? Well, our guest today, uh, Ren- Professor Randy Picker, teaches antitrust and courses involving IP and tech at the University of Chicago Law School with distinguished titles and affiliations, including with the Computation Institute of the University of Chicago Argonne National Laboratory and the Co Sander Institute for Law and Economics. And and uh, myself, and like many who are listening, probably we know Professor Picker as as a scholar who has invested in the studies of antitrust dealing with tech. And then uh, you perhaps also, like myself, follow his Twitter feed that engage in those interesting conversations. Well, let's bring him in. Professor Picker, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Hi, Professor Picker. Uh, Hello and welcome. Uh, Let's go to the very beginning of the case. Um, Would you give us the story, like what's the basis of the IBM case and how did it come? Well, I love the fact, Nora, that you went back earlier. So you went back to the 1930s and the 1950s, and I I do think that's the right place to start. Just to be perfect, honest, I have to look up look it up. What's a tabulating equipment like? You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't. (laughs) And John and I, we haven't compared ages. I, as an undergraduate at the University of Chicago, came in at the very end of punch cards uh, and did some programming on punch cards in Fortran. Uh, when I was in college. John, did you do punch cards or not? I, I did not, but I believe I was born the year the IBM case uh, investigation was started. Okay. So um, in any event, so the government does bring, as Honora said, this epic case against IBM in the 1930s relating to punch cards. It's a tying case. Um, uh, and the government wins that case, goes to the Supreme Court. So epic success. 
enough of a success that in the 1950s, when nothing had changed in the marketplace relating to tabulating equipment and punch cards, they sued him again. Um, and so the government sues IBM in the 1950s, but they also sue AT&T, and they settle those cases one day after the other um, in 1956. I think the AT&T case is really relevant to what we're talking about today because the AT&T case does two things. It opens up the world of semiconductors and the patents associated with that to the world, but it also quarantined AT&T uh, and kept AT&T out of the computer business proper. And so when people think about the 1956 AT&T settlement, I think they tend to focus on the way in which it opened up the patents for semiconductors. You need to pay attention to the business limitations it imposed because IBM grows into, and IBM has been an enormously successful company for many years, but it grows into this behemoth in the 1960s. They released the System 360 computer in 1964. That's a mainframe computer. It's a substantial success. Uh, the rest of the industry is quite small. Um, the industry was described sometimes as uh, IBM and the Seven Dwarves um, because there were seven smaller competitors. Um, but part of the success story there is is a great product, but the fact that we'd taken uh, one of its maybe best competitors uh, off the table uh, in, in taking AT&T off the table. Okay what to do about all of that, if anything. So um, in the waning days of the Johnson administration, uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson, uh, the government brings three lawsuits, basically before they're closing up shop, and then says uh, to uh, uh, the, the next presidency here, it's all yours, you guys go deal with it. Um, and so the 1969 suit brought against IBM really focused on the way, and I think, um, and John and Honora, you set this up, and this will get us to, I think, what's relevant for today, really was about how, Mike, how Microsoft, how IBM was bundling together hardware, software, and services. And then the inability of firms to interconnect into this ecosystem that IBM had defined. Um, so you had companies like Telex that wanted to sell um, these big tape drives that you've undoubtedly seen in you know, old movies about like Apollo 13 or something like that. Um, people wanted to enter that market and IBM was making that hard. So uh, I guess just get a little deeper to what motivated the government to bring the case. You mentioned the bundling. That's a specific conduct that's, that's causing concern. But uh, just to put a little background in this conversation. By 1967, I guess IBM has become the largest U.S. public firm by market capitalization. And some, I guess, you know, uh, press report at time put IBM's market share in computers in the range of 70 percent, something like that. And with the second largest, that that should be Honeywell at something like 7.4 percent. So I guess the question is, other than just a straightforward concern over the conduct. Has there been any concern just arising out of the sheer size and market share that IBM has? Sure. So it's completely fair to say, and, and, and this is, again, to tie it to what we're seeing today, um, that IBM, as you just described, Nora, was, was the you know, most valuable company on the planet. So it had a, a significance that um, you know, sometimes I think we forget. Now, I, I think what's different about that is, is if you ask the, you know, average person on the street what their experience was with IBM, I suspect they would have said very little. And that's obviously not true uh, of the GAFA, uh, Google, Amazon, Facebook, uh, and Amazon. Um, uh, but um, IBM was, as you're suggesting, one of, along with maybe AT&T, the great tech firms of the day. So it was, it was a very, very important company. Um, and American business, in some sense, the infrastructure of American business from a computing standpoint was clearly IBM. Right, right. And then back to the concern of the conduct, you mentioned the bundling, and then also I, I think uh, a cousin that is tying, then that's basically grouping a, a group of products and then have them uh, sold together. That seems to be a repeating theme in some earlier cases against the tech companies. Is that so? Yeah, so, yeah. Certainly the, the punch card cases that you started up at the beginning in the 1930s were exactly about tying. Uh, the concerns with regard to AT&T at various points were again about the ability of people to interconnect to this dominant system. Um, so um, 
uh, you know, uh, Hushaphone and Carterphone, if we want to head inside uh, the world of telecommunications, those were cases about interconnection. And again, the IBM case, I think it's completely fair to see it as a kind of interconnection ecosystem case. And that's a, a continuing theme through the Microsoft case and, and through today. Right, right. And then going to the like the, the the remedy that the government is seeking, right? Like the IBM, I think uh, they voluntarily announced that they would unbundle um, uh, basically the hardware, software, and services in the mainframe computer. I think shortly after or before the in, the the case was brought. Is that right? And then yeah. So so I'm I'm sure you can't see over the air my. my um uh, air quotes on voluntary. So I think it's very <laughs> hard to know how to think about voluntary there. Right. But it is completely fair to say that roughly coincident with the uh, investigation and then the uh, ultimate bringing of the case, IBM engaged in exactly the kind of bundling, uh, unbundling uh, mm -hmm. that the government was seeking. So, you know, IBM, their experts say, well, we were going to do this anyhow. So um, who knows what to really make of that from a ca causation standpoint. Uh, but one of the chief remedies that the government was seeking, um, you know, came out uh, very quickly. Um, and in that sense, you might say, well, the government won the case, and yet they ran the case for 13 years before dismissing it. Right, right. And then uh, just to be clear, the unbundling uh, with air quotation voluntarily yeah. <laughs> announced by I mean, does not, uh, did not uh, completely resolve uh, the, the antitrust concern of the government. Is that right? No, and indeed the government, and I'll, I'll, I think I'll get the dates right. I mean, the government amends the complaint like six years in. So I think there's a 1975 amendment to the complaint. So here's a case that's been running for six years and the government says, oh, here, here's what we want to talk about now. And again, part of that was related to the separate private lawsuits that had been brought against IBM relating to, again, the ability to interconnect to the system. Uh, Telex was one of those, but there were any number of other cases. Right. And then following on uh, the, the, our discussion on Remedy, perhaps there is there's more profound decisions on IBM makes in, in terms of their later generations of technologies. Is that right? So are they... Uh, so, Perhaps your 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 paper uh, suggests that there has been a decision about open versus closed architecture when IBM yeah, moves, moves sure. to yeah to to personal it, computer. Is that, in your view, connected to the to the uh, antitrust well, case I, at all? I, you know, I look. I think the, uh, there there are lots of these situations where you're looking back over time, and it's hard to be absolutely sure. So I've certainly read reports from people, sort of as it were, inside the room. Right. who said that the pendency of the um, uh, antitrust case, which ran until early of 1982, influenced some choices that were made with regard to the IBM PC. So IBM released its uh, personal computer on August 12th, 1981. Uh, the PC market is incredibly young. 1977 is a, in, is a very important date in personal computer history as you get the release of the Apple II um, uh, Radio Shack slash Tandy released a computer, and then I guess Commodore did as well. But IBM's entry into the personal computer market completely validated that market and really put it on a firm footing. And the machine they built was an enormously successful machine. Now, one of the critical decisions they made um, was to um, not provide their own operating system. And they'd had some troubles on this on smaller machines. Mm -hmm. And also not to provide uh, their own uh, uh, microprocessor. Uh, so they looked to Intel for the microprocessor. And then, and, and this is worth noting, um, they actually released the, the um, computer with three different operating systems. Mm -hmm. One of those is from a company uh, that we know now as Microsoft. <laughs> but Microsoft, when, my, when IBM approached them, was really just a computer languages company. Uh, they, had fame, they had written BASIC for a different personal computer uh, before even the 1977 computers. Uh, and, and IBM goes to Microsoft to license BASIC, a few other languages, and says, can you give us an operating system? And Microsoft says, no, sorry, we can't help you. There's this other company you should go talk to. So I think it's, I, I, I see that history, right? right. At, the point where, at the point where IBM, as we know it from, the, from what happens later, is going to give Microsoft this epic monopoly. That's what it turns into, obviously. Gates... 
Bill Gates, Paul Allen say, thanks, that's not us, you should go somewhere else. And there's a, a really interesting story as to how they get back to Microsoft. And of course, eventually what happens here is, is uh, the MS-DOS, PC-DOS on the IBM PC itself takes off, Intel 886 takes off, uh, the Wintel uh, platform emerges, Microsoft software, um, uh, Intel chips, uh, a cologne market emerges and IBM loses control of the PC platform, but they built um, and Microsoft and Intel become the biggest kids on the block. Right, right. I think just to, f I guess, focus on that little snippet of the history, it's really remarkable that, you know, one thing leads to another. And then, as you said, when we look back, it's hard to to pinpoint the causal relation between one event and another. But but it's perfectly legitimate to, to wonder, I guess, does the government's antitrust case has any sort of influence on the, the, those comp uh, companies' decision to sort of be more open uh, and then to sort of like, you know, to integrate more uh, elements from from external companies, right? Yeah. So I think, and I think another angle on that that I think is actually important is that after the uh, IBM case is dismissed, and, and just to fill in on this, quite remarkably, um, in early January of 1982, um, uh, the government same day announces that they have settled uh, the the um, AT and T case, which was brought in 1974, and that AT and T is going to be broken up. So this epic breakup of AT and T is announced, and at the same time, same day, uh, the government says, "Oh, we're we're also dismissing the IBM case." And so, when you look at how IBM tried to regain control over the PC platform and subsequent design choices after the case was dismissed, I think you see them play a much more aggressive proprietary strategy. They do that with regard to software. They do that with regard to hardware. Uh, but in some sense, you know, uh, uh, the horse is out of the uh, out of the barn. I guess uh, I don't know anything about horses or barns, but I guess that's how that works. <laughs> yeah, um, I didn't get that. Metaphor yeah, that's right. with the technology about a hundred years before. Right, the chicken, the <laughs> egg. Who knew? Who knew how? Okay, but IBM can't regain control over it. It's gone, um, and Microsoft and Intel effectively are in the driver's seat. And so, my uh, IBM played a much more aggressive strategy once they. Two things, understood that the PC market was really a big deal. And I think when they were building the PC, they didn't begin to understand that, though no one else did, to be fair to them, I think. Uh, but also you get um, the fact that they've lost control over it. Um, and can they regain control? And the answer to that turned out to be no. Yeah. Well, let's engage in some hypothetical thinking. <laughs> what What do you think, what, you know, how, how things have played out if, if the government didn't bring that case at all? Against IBM. Yeah. Um, so that's interesting. Um, uh, uh, yeah. I, you know, I, 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 it's hard to know for sure, obviously. Um, and um, I, I think it's fair to say that the importance of the IBM PC internally in IBM, uh, there was uh, disagreement. Some people thought it was an important project. Other people said, no, this doesn't really matter. We're in the mainframe business. This is just like kid stuff. Um, so, um, would they have, would they have negotiated more aggressively for equity stakes in Intel and, um, uh, Microsoft, maybe that would have been a path you could have taken. Um, uh, I, I don't, I mean, I think they had struggled to build the operating system for, they'd had a smallish computer before the PC. So, uh, you know, but, but who knows? Right, right. And then I guess uh, I'm going to quote you. I think in uh, one of your recent paper, uh, you, you, you argue that the success or failure of Section 2, which is the U.S. antitrust law that, that's governing monopolization, uh, you said that the success or failure of Section 2 in computing should be judged as to how it has shaped or failed to shape competition in current markets, in adjacent markets, and in future markets. Yeah. So how did the government do in the 1969 IBM case? And and perhaps like, you know, to put it another way, what's the most important lessons that that's to be drawn from the IBM case in your well, opinion? Well, so, so I, I guess I want to say a couple of things. So, so look, I think uh, the modern software market uh, sort of emerges again in, in conjunction with, with these events. So, um, software patents emerge in the 1960s in part because people want to sell software 
um, and IBM is sort of just incorporating stuff into their software. Um, and because they're not charging a separate price for the software, and in some sense they're making most of the money off of off of the hardware, IBM doesn't care that there's a meaningful market for software. Uh, but if you want to be in the software business, if you want to write IBM software and sell it, then you need to have meaningful property rights there. And the fact that the unbundling takes place, you know, that starts to lead to the early days of, of, of the software market. So I, I think that's important there. I, I do think these, these uh, interconnection issues um, are, um, uh, you know, continuing. Um, and um, as, you, as you watch, um, you know, fights over Google or Amazon or Apple, um, these interconnection issues continue to be, and, and interoperability issues, I think, continue to be some of the central issues uh, that we have. I, get, I, I think the government, you know, gets credit for seeing that as the right set of issues, right? Now, sometimes ans- asking the right question is important, and, and we can fight about whether you get the right answer, but asking good questions really matters a lot. And in some sense, the 1969 complaint, um, you know, is focusing on, on Im- an important set of issues. So I give them a lot of credit for that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then bearing those lessons in mind, I guess, and then perhaps look at the tech world that we live in today and then vis-a-vis the antitrust enforcement um, by the U.S. government, as, as John has put it in the title, is, is history repeating itself? Well, I mean, I, I think it always does. <laughs> so I'll, I'll say yes. Uh-huh. Um, I mean, what I, I guess what I mean by that is, is look, if you, if you focus on, um, uh, you know, Google, uh, as an example, um, the, you know, the question of how Google does or does not display so-called vertical search engines, Yelp and the like, um, that's a kind of interconnection issue. Um, is there some sort of standard under which vertical search engines should be entitled to be Uh, visible in Google searches under some sort of neutrality principle? Or can Google say, sorry, guys, it's our product. We can link to whatever we want to. And if we choose to link to our own properties over your properties, that's that's what we get to do. If IBM says, look, we get to define the interface for these for these tape drives to hook up to the mainframes, uh, we get to control that. And the fact that that means you're unable to enter that's not our issue. It's a product design point. So I, I do think some of the product design issues uh, continue to work that way. I think if you look at at, at, at some of the fights over Apple, um, and and we haven't really seen you know real U.S. fights yet, but mm-hmm. but we're certainly seeing fights in Europe, um, a couple of different um, investigations there, more likely coming. You know those fights relate to I think two issues mainly. One of those is is sort of the you know, the, the, I, the, the app store tax, as it were, the 30% figure you see talked about, is that too high? But the other issue that you see, um, Spotify raised this in Europe, Tile has raised this as well, um, is the question of sort of interoperability. Uh, Spotify was very clear in saying, oh, Apple Music can access Apple Watches in a way that we can't. And that's exactly the same kind of interoperability and interconnection issues uh, that we saw in the 1969 IBM case. Uh, and again, m- m- at least in parallel or maybe earlier uh, for the um, AT&T phone system. I have a, I have a question, Professor Picker. Um, what's different about today? I mean, I think one thing that comes to mind for me and it's a point you just made a second ago is you're now not talking about the DOJ and maybe the FTC like you were in 1969. You're talking about um, competition regimes all over the world, and and frankly, a, a more aggressive, um, at least on this year issue, a more aggressive enforcer in Europe. Yeah. What, what any anything else that you see that's really where the landscape has has changed in a meaningful way? Well, I, so so I, I think it's fair to say what you just said, though I will say, and you know, it's amazing what you go. Oh, I didn't know that. How I'm supposed to know a lot? How did I not know this? But. You know, I stumbled into the just the other day in some material I was looking at some European, really early 
uh, and they're talking about the European Economic Community or something. You know, I'm calling it the European Union cases against IBM. So there are parallel cases out there. I don't know those cases that well, so I'll, I'll stop there. But they exist. You're certainly right to say, and, and this is maybe what I see is the other difference. Look, IBM was really important to big companies. Um, you know, I grew up in Akron, Ohio, uh, and I grew up in Akron, Ohio. In some sense, I say because of IBM. Um, and what that means is, is that my father worked for Firestone Tire and Rubber Company. We, I was born in the St. Louis area. At some point uh, in, you know, in the 1960s, uh, these big companies said, oh, we need to bring these machines into our offices, and how do we get them to run? And they, they had no clue, and there wasn't this cadre of computer science graduates. So they brought in people from the field to do that. And my father was one of those, so we moved to Akron, Ohio. Um, you know, IBM mattered inside companies. The companies we're talking about today mattered to basically everyone on the planet. Um, uh, and so the companies, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, uh, a little bit to a lesser extent, Microsoft, but maybe even not Microsoft, the GAFM, those companies have a salience to the world that um, uh, is, is uh, it's unprecedented, the word, maybe. Uh, it's certainly uh, extraordinary. Well, and, and, you know, the, say, make the obvious point, and there's four of them or five of them, depending on whether you want to give, give yourself an M at the end, right? Yep. And, and, yep. and it, they're, they're kind of all doing different things. Um, and, and I think maybe what's remarkable is you think about the IBM case and the government fought against IBM on technology for, you know, decades, you know, and, you know, repeated wars. And then yes. you think about the Microsoft case. And, you know, and, and, and now we're talking about really m multiple giants that are being looked at very closely. Yes. And, 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 and being looked at, you know, we've seen a series of reports coming out um, uh, in the United States, in the UK, uh, Europe, uh, Australia. Uh, I, I know the ones in English best. Um, uh, there's no question. And as John, as you were suggesting, I, uh, there are different you know, antitrust slash competition policy sensibilities uh, across the planet. Um, and so even if the United States reaches a conclusion, there's no guarantee that, that the European Commission won't reach a different conclusion. Um, and these companies, precisely because they operate at a world scale, have to figure out how to make all of these uh, antitrust agencies across the planet happy. Yeah, that's fascinating. I have, I guess, my final substantive question is that I think I've heard commentators say there has been a downsizing of U.S. antitrust enforcement, particularly against monopolization, and particularly involving tech. Do you agree with that? Do you, or given what we just discussed, that there is more to watch and there is more antitrust regimes that's in action. That's that's perhaps not the case, or perhaps uh, doesn't matter that much anymore. Yeah, so so I it's I think it's completely fair to say that and I I have some you mentioned this paper that I published in the University of Chicago Law Review in the last six months or something, um, and I have the statistics in there. Um, it's completely fair to say that there has not been a lot of Section Two action by the government. Uh, there's some cases uh, at lower levels. Um, uh, you know, John mentioned Microsoft. That really is the case we think of as the great. Uh, Section two recent <laughs> case, and of course the, the the original decision in in you know from the D.C. Circuit, the on Bank, it's I guess two thousand. So um, uh, that's extraordinary. Um, and so um, you know, and and there's obviously a lot of energy uh, across the com across the planet about these companies right now. Yeah, fascinating. I mean, fascinating, and and I think um, more to come. Uh, Oh yes, on these on these issues. Well, um, Professor, this has been great. Let, let me shift gears a little bit and ask you uh, from a, a, a different type of question. Tell us something interesting about yourself that we wouldn't know about you if we only knew you professionally. Uh, well, I never claim to be interesting, uh, but I, I know what uh, occasionally people find interesting about me, I guess. Um, I um, do improvisational comedy. Um, so um, uh, you can go on YouTube and if you at least know how to search in the right way, um, 
uh, you can find an uh, improv show. A show, have, I'll do, say. Do We've you have a stage one. name? Do you- <laughs> well, the, I, I, I actually improvise with two different groups. Uh, I, I will tell you quickly, since you asked. Improvisational comedy starts um, in, in Hyde Park in the 1950s. Uh, Mike Nichols, Elaine May, um, those are, may not be names that you all know. Mike Nichols, EGOTS, which means he won, wins Emmy, Grammy, Oscar, and Tonys. He's a sort of an epic Hollywood figure, directed The Graduate. He was an undergraduate at, in, at the University of Chicago in the 1950s. Um, Elaine May, uh, who won a Tony, I want to say, last year uh, on Broadway. Um, there she is uh, hanging out. And this art form, this great American art form, improvisational comedy, starts in Hyde Park in the 1950s. Second City grows out of that. Um, and Chicago is a great improv city. Um, I, I have three kids, uh, lots of soccer driving on the weekends. That was great. Eventually that stopped. And I said to my wife, oh, maybe I should take an improv class. And she said, yes, um, I should do that. And so I, I, that's something I do. Um, uh, I, it's, it's a, I'm happy to talk about that almost indefinitely. Uh, but that would be the answer, I think, to your question. You know, I, I've had a similar conversation with my wife where I suggested, no, you know, I'm very funny. Maybe I should take an improv class. And the feedback I've gotten is that that would not be a good use of, of, of our money and that I'm a lot less funny than I think I am. You know, and this is, I'll, I'll pitch for a second. I don't, that's, I hear it. Uh, that's, I don't think that's the right way to think about it. So when I was taking improv classes at Second City and IO and The Annoyance, I would say, oh, I'm going to listening practice. What's so, so important about improv is listening. You go on, you go on stage with a group or an individual, you really have nothing. There's no script. You're going to create something in the moment together. So it's an act of pure creativity. That's one of the things I love about it. Um, But you have to listen almost word by word, stare at facial, see what happens. And so I think it's a good activity. I'm a big fan of it for lawyers generally. And funny is great, but funny is only part of it. That's what I keep saying. Uh, Professor, professor, have have you ever had to do an improv skit? that um, was focused on um, some sort of antitrust issue? Well, so it's it's funny. I mean, you know, you do these things. So I remember one, um, uh, 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 and I, it was a former student of mine who I've improvised with. Uh, and I, we were in a class together and we were doing at IO and doing a student show. And uh, we ended up, uh, you know, uh, one of the things that uh, you go into the improv, you go, wow, they use words I don't always use in public. Um, uh, so uh, uh, you have to get used to that. And, and you get the idea that everyone else in these classes is like 23 to 28, and I'm who I am. In any event, there was a former student. Um, and we had this great, and I knew she could play this because she was a lawyer, a scene uh, with sort of sexual double entendre about horizontal mergers, and you you can see where that might go. So, uh, is that on YouTube? That one is not on YouTube. <laughs> no, no. Professor, I know we are going to be coming back to this, perhaps not on this program, but you may very well get a call from some of the booking agents at the antitrust law section. <laughs> um, but. Uh, yeah. Now I think it's time for our final segment that we call The Curious Hat. And now it's time for The Curious Hat. All right, Randy, uh, in my hand is a a set of questions. When we are together in the studio, I have an actual hat that has actual questions in it. I pull a question out of the hat and I ask that question. Since we are doing this remotely, I have uh, I'm wearing a hat but mm. I have a list of questions um, and okay. they are numbered from one to 25. So I will ask you to choose a number and I will read the num- uh, question associated with that number. Uh, 23. 23, going to the back end. Okay. What is your favorite special occasion food or drink? Uh, so my wife makes this great German chocolate cake uh, that she will make for um, my birthday or other people's birthdays. Uh, my grandmother made a German chocolate cake, so maybe that's part of a tie to it, though I think I would independently love it, even if it didn't have the family history. And is that chocolate cake, is that basically a birthday cake, or does it come up in other occasions? I want to be clear. It's not a chocolate cake. It's a German chocolate German cake. German chocolate cake, right. Those are not the same. Um, 
So um, uh, I, I will say it typically gets made in connection with birthdays, um, but it's perfectly acceptable for it to make an appearance at Thanksgiving. And Nora, just to clarify, German chocolate cake has, I believe, has German engineering. It flies down the autobahn. Yeah. So uh, uh, I, there's, you know, there's a there's a trade name. I mean, a trademark called German. I, I think that may be part of it. I mean, so it's not it's not a standard chocolate cake. The icing has got a lot of coconut in it. Um, so yes, I, I highly recommend it. And with that, I think we are at the end. Thank you, and we will see you next time on our Curious Amalgam. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Our Curious Amalgam, a competition, consumer protection, data protection, and privacy law podcast. It is produced and shared around the globe by ABA's Antitrust Law Section. The opinions expressed by the participants in this podcast are their own and do not necessarily represent their employer or other organizations. If you like what you heard or would like to become a member of the American Bar Association, please check out what the Antitrust Section has to offer at ambar.org antitrust. You can learn more about our podcast at at ourcuriousamalgam.com. If you have comments, suggestions, or podcasts, podcast ideas, please reach out to us at podcast at ourcuriousamalgam.com. Until next time, thank you for listening.